Welcome back live to NASA's Kennedy Space Center. I'm Joshua Santor with NASA Communications, uh, coming to you live on our press site lawn here, a beautiful day on the sunny Space Coast. We are preparing in one day from right now, we will be kicking off launch coverage of the Demo-2 mission, NASA and SpaceX launching the Crew Dragon with Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley flying to the International Space Station. Uh, Want to jump right in here, but make sure that you guys are asking your questions live online. A huge thank you to our NASA social participants, as well as the virtual launch experience guests. Happy to have you guys along. Um, I want to jump right in here and introduce the folks on my right. So to your far left, beginning out here, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein. Astronaut Nicole Mann. Astronaut Cho Lindgren. Cho Lindgren, excuse me and uh, shuttle astronaut and KSC Kennedy Space Center director, Bob Cabana. Thanks you all for joining me today. Uh, pleasure to have you along. We're gonna jump right in here uh, and kind of chat through um, what's going on right now, what happened this week, and then get to the social questions as fast as we can and get through as many as we can. Uh, Mr. Bridenstine, wanted to ask you, give us a quick recap. Obviously yeah. we did not fly Wednesday, um, so what happened, why didn't we fly, and where are we looking to go tomorrow? What's, what's gonna happen tomorrow? That's a great question. So Wednesday, it looked like everything was good. We had a clearing. There were no thunderstorms right overhead. Um, and so we thought we were going to have a good opportunity to go. Um, we, 15 minutes before launch time, we have a threshold of how much electricity can be in the atmosphere. And based on that threshold, if we're above that, we're in a no-go criteria. And that, that's where we ended up. It's not that we had a thunderstorm. It's not that we didn't have good. It didn't look good. It looked like we were ready to go. But given the amount of electricity in the air, what can happen is a launch can actually trigger lightning um, and, and, and the rocket can actually become a lightning bolt. And of course, that would be a very, very bad day. The probability is low, but the impact, of course, would be, would be devastating. So, so we made the right call. And I want to be clear, I'm so proud of the NASA team, so proud of the SpaceX team. They made the right decision for the right reasons. Yes, the whole world was watching. Yes, we had all of the VIPs here but we made the right decision for the right reasons, and we will continue doing that. If it is not safe, we will not go. Bob and Doug are our highest priority, um, and, and they are top of mind. So um, that's, that's what got us. The, the electricity in the atmosphere got us. And so recycle and same thing again tomorrow? Uh, possibly tomorrow, possibly Sunday. Okay. Um, right now we're planning on tomorrow. We're going to get a weather update this afternoon. The challenge, of course, is that we don't want to put the whole team through a wet dress rehearsal two days in a row. Sure. So if this afternoon, if we if we believe Sunday is looking more probabilistic than Saturday, uh, we might we might target Sunday instead. Um, but again, here's what we know: we will launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. It will happen again. It will happen right here at the Kennedy Space Center, and it will be Bob and Doug. Um, whether that happens this weekend or a day in the future, uh, it will happen. Yeah, one of the things that you mentioned there, so important, the, the challenge of saying we're not gonna fly today. It's a really incredible thing to say we're gonna fly today, but it's even more difficult to say not today That's because right. of how much is going on. Um, so again, proud of those teams just as you are. Um, and I wanna jump over, Mr. Cabana, uh, four-time shuttle astronaut, you have, you've experienced some sitting in, in the shuttle, waiting to fly scrubs. And so what's that like um, sitting up there and then you kind of have to wait a little bit, the crew access arm is retracted, you were all set and now it's another day. So actually my first three flights all launched <laughs> the day that we <laughs> climbed in. But that last one out on that very same pad, we counted down to 18 seconds and didn't go. And oh, uh, man, man, at that point, you just want to launch into space. Yeah. But, but the crew doesn't get a vote. 
all right? Mm. Because they'd say yes to anything at that point. <laughs> so, uh, you know, obviously there's disappointment that you're not going, but uh, you work through your, uh, you know, back out procedures from launch count. There's certain things that have to be accomplished. The crew t does their procedures. You work through it all. You climb out of the vehicle and you go back to crew quarters. And uh, the thing I told my crew when we were getting out of the Astro van, going back into crew quarters, is everybody just wave and smile. You know, <laughs> give them a thumbs up. It's all good. Uh, the right thing happened. And sure. uh, actually, the next day we went. Next night we went back out, and it was just a flawless, uh, smooth count, and we got off. So, you know, we didn't have a lot of time because we were launching again the next day. We were we were tired. We uh, we got a good night's sleep. And uh, then we went through the whole process again of climbing into the vehicle. Bob and Doug had a little more time. I'm sure they're using it as an opportunity to catch back up with their families, uh, uh, grab a, a quick recharge, and uh, get ready to do it again. But, you know, these guys are professionals, and they're going to they're gonna do another amazing job. And it doesn't matter whether they go or not. They're going to do everything correctly and uh, make sure that it's done right. Yeah, that was one of the things I was really happy to see with the coverage we had on Wednesday was the fact that there's a lot of work that happens after a scrub. Most people, if you see a scrub, you just turn off the channel. You just, boop, we're done. Um, but the team's here, hours worth of work to make sure that we do this safely every step of the way. So, again, just so much pride here. Uh, Chell, you were on Expeditions 44 and 45, um, waiting to ride again into space, hopefully. I'm sure you're just anxious to go. Uh, you're getting the chance to watch the Crew Dragon, the Starliner, and the Orion all coming together. Do you have a favorite? Are you like, ho are you kind of secretly hoping like, I get this one? Like, is there a favorite? I thought I was going to get an easy question. <laughs> you know, um, I've been training for the past year and a half uh, with SpaceX uh, as the backup for Bob and Doug and for, for Crew One. That's been a phenomenal experience. So excited about uh, the Boeing Starliner and getting to watch uh, Nicole uh, and, and uh, that crew make that first launch later this year. Um, but I, you know, I grew up uh, in the 70s and 80s. Of course, we had the space shuttle flying uh, in the 80s, but man, watching those iconic images of our astronauts working on the moon. Mm. And uh, I've, bought, I've been wanted to be an astronaut for as long as I can remember. And it's, it was to do that, to, to, to go to the moon. And so I am so excited about the Artemis program. Uh, the fact that we're going to establish a permanent base on the moon, we're going to see the first woman, the next man, working on the moon, and uh, and so that's why I'm so excited about this launch because it is really, uh, I mean, we stand at the threshold of a new era of space flight, and this this flight, the, whether it's this weekend or later this week, uh, is really opening the door to that, um, opening the door to continued uh, use of our incredible International Space Station and preparing us for that mission uh, with this Artemis generation to explore the moon. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to think there's anything wrong about saying, I want to go to the moon. Like, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty awesome bar to, to shoot for. Unless you're going to Mars. That's true. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you Sign skip me the moon? Round of uh, we did have a question about what's a scrub. Um, I use that term. I, I don't know if anybody else did, uh, but want to make sure that people are clear that basically that's, uh, and you may be able to tell me if I'm wrong technically here, but it's that we were in the countdown, we were working towards launch, and in the middle of the countdown, we had to call off launch. Is that, are there technical things that I missed there? No, I think that's it. Okay. You got it. All right, perfect. All right. So, Nicole, over to you. I um, want to ask you, you got to kind of be a, a spectator on Wednesday, getting to watch Bob and Doug climb in, strap in, door closed, arm retracted, countdown going, fueling started, and then we scrub. Um, so what's that emotion like before we get to that scrub moment? Like, you've got to be thinking about your flight. You've got to be thinking about Bob and Doug and, like, just the energy there. So what's the emotions that you're feeling on that moment? Absolutely. I tell you, the day of launch is something that I play over in my mind time and time again, and it's something that, that I've always dreamed of. And so I'm right there with Doug and Bob as, as they go through this every step, right? They wake up in the morning, think about everything you need to do. Getting suited up, I'm checking every zipper, every pocket. I'm ready to go. You're walking out to the launch pad. You're running through in your mind. What are my checklists? What are all the things? Has my thought of everything that I need to do? getting in that capsule, strapping in. Now they're going to fuel the rocket, right? Looking at the displays. Am I monitoring the right thing? I'm running through my mind everything. And I am with them every step of the way, I tell you. And, and it's exciting. I can feel my heart rate rising right now just thinking about it. So what I, what I tell you out there, if you're watching this launch, join me on this journey. Follow the crew. 
throughout the day, through every step, and think about in your mind, dream of that. What would that be like for you to suit up, to walk to the rocket, to get in? Because today it might be a dream, but not too far in the future. You might be sitting on top of that rocket and you might be launching to the moon or Mars. So take advantage of that. Jalen, you gotta throw in, you know, I don't care how prepared you are, no amount of training or simulator rides prepares you for when that rocket lights off. That is one heck of a ride and it's better than a cat shot. <laughs> well said. So we had a question, Chell, I'm gonna throw this one to you. Um, you're the most recent to fly into space. Uh, a nine-year-old nine Eva from New Hampshire asked, what types of food do astronauts get to bring with them? Oh, that's a great question. You know, when we first get to the space station, um, we get a briefing from the, uh, the, the commander there and they show us uh, the bathroom, they show us where to get our food, and they show us where we're gonna sleep. And then we cover the emergencies, of course, uh, obviously. But, uh, but that's a really important thing. You know, we eat every day, and the food uh, lab we have at Johnson Space Center has done an amazing job making sure that we've got a good variety and very healthful foods. And so, you know, um, we have barbecue beef brisket, we have uh, turkey, we have um, corn, Half of our food is dehydrated that we have to add water to. The other half has been prepared and we just use a food warmer. Uh, some of my favorites were uh, the, the maple muffin for breakfast and then the chocolate pudding cake uh, for dessert. Um, I have a little bit of a sweet tooth apparently, All right. but, uh, but the food is great. Fantastic. Uh, Mr. Brinstein, question about the recycle here, getting ready to do this again. Uh, will all events leading to launch be in the exact same order? Um, astronauts dressing up, going to the Teslas, headed to the white room, or do we change anything? No, it'll be the, look, the, the key is repetition and muscle memory. Mm. So uh, everything will be the same yet again. Um, you know, like I said, one thing that we'd like to do this time is if, if, if the probability of going is not high on Saturday, um, we, we, might not, we might not pull the trigger on Saturday, we might go on Sunday. Um, and of course, what we don't want to do is end up doing back-to-back wet dress rehearsals. We might do it, I'm not saying we won't. Uh, if, if, if we try it on Saturday and then Sunday miraculously clears up, we might go again. But, um, but the, the, the amount of uh, effort that it takes to go through that is, is a lot. So we wanna make sure that we're not um, unduly burdening people. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Caban, a question for you. Um, thinking about the, will this mission be any different than future crewed flights? Uh, because it's a demonstration flight, are we going to see much change from flight to flight? Well, you know, we're going to have to see. First off, this is a test flight, and we are going to learn from it, and there will be changes that get made afterwards. You know, I'm not going to rest easy until Bob and Doug are home safely after a successful mission on orbit and back here on, uh, on Earth. But, you know, eventually we are going to get to where we are flying a regular cadence of both the Boeing and the SpaceX vehicles with more than just two astronauts aboard. And this is the future. So, you know, we want to get to where we have that regularity, where we understand the vehicles and we can progress to the point where we're more comfortable doing it. But we are going to learn from this test flight and that's why we're being extra careful on this first flight. Yeah, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. Can you talk about launch windows really fast? So there's a question about instantaneous launch windows. Yeah. Why is it instantaneous? and uh, why do we move three days instead of just trying again on Thursday? So uh, it depends on a couple of things. First off, this is orbital mechanics, all right? The space station is orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes, and there's only certain times that it comes over Florida where we can launch and catch up to it, all right? So the reason for the instantaneous window is, like, on Space Shuttle, we had about a five-minute window that we could launch within. Uh, SpaceX they still have a, a time frame that they can launch within, but they choose an instantaneous point within that window to launch. And then it's based on the performance of the vehicle also. Uh, they're going to be recovering this first stage on the barge out at sea. So, you know, you have to take the propellant of the vehicle, its performance into consideration, as well as this uh, orbital mechanics window of when you can actually rendezvous with the space station. And that uh, moves earlier every day. So if you notice, we're two days later, we're about, uh, we went from uh, you know, a 4.30 launch to a 3.30 launch. So about 30 minutes every day, give or take, you know, it's gonna move a little bit earlier. So next week, it's gonna be even earlier in the day, and that's because of the orbital mechanics. Perfect. And of course, in Florida, the earlier, the, the, the better the weather. Yes, so, <laughs> afternoon thunderstorms, we don't want them to get them. Yep. Right. 
And there's something that actually drives home the fact that we are flying to the space station. For those of you that have seen a night launch, and, and uh, my, my launch was at night, um, the guests get treated to seeing the space station fly over first, Absolutely. and then we launch. Yeah. And, and so you really get that sense of, man, we are, we're going to chase after that, uh, that yeah. space station to dock. And yeah. If anybody has not gone out and seen a space station pass, I mean, it is the brightest star in the sky. It is so cool, especially when it's one of these really high inclination passes that comes over from west to east, and you can just track it across the sky. I remember the first time I thought, I thought, what is that? An airplane somewhere land? You know, with its landing light on, it is just amazingly bright. Yeah, if you're not familiar, um, head online and on your search engine, search NASA, spot the station. You can actually get text messages or email updates as to when that's going to happen, when you can see it from your city, which is great. Um, and it's, distinct, it's distinguished by the fact that there's no flashing lights. It's a solid constant, and it moves really quickly, uh, much faster than an airliner can at this point. Um, so uh, there was, this question was aimed at the astronauts, but I'll kind of do it for everybody. 30 seconds, how did you get to the position you are today? So kind of what's your background? Um, what brought you to this moment in time? Mr. Brunstein? I'm a Navy pilot by trade. I've always had an interest in aviation and aerospace in general. Um, I got elected to the United States House of Representatives. I was on the Armed Services Committee, Strategic Forces Subcommittee, which deals with all of um, you know, the national security space apparatus of the United States of America. I was also on the science committee, which oversees NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Forty percent of their budget is based on space-related activities, and of course it also oversees NASA. So as a member of Congress, I was steeped into kind of the, 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 the national space apparatus, got very involved. I drafted a bill uh, called the American Space Renaissance Act. It got a lot of attention, and then um, when the president got elected, um, I, I went, I, my name popped up somehow. I'm still not 100% sure how that <laughs> happened. Um, but, uh, but I went through an interview process and uh, was asked to be the NASA administrator. Cool. Glad that you are making lots of progress really fast. Thank you. Nicole? Sure. I grew up in a small town in Northern California. And when I was younger, I really loved math and science, but I also really loved soccer. And that was my focus. All right, there we life. go. You know, so I'm trying to decide as a, as a young kid where to go to college. I was really conflicted. I, I knew I wanted to serve in the military, so I started looking at the service academies. And the Naval Academy had an incredible soccer team. Uh, the coach there was my idol growing up as, as a young girl. And so it was an um, engineering school. I could serve my military, and I could play soccer. It was kind of the best of both worlds. So initially, I just started following my passions in life. Um, you know, before my first, my senior year, I got a ride in the F-18. And that kind of sealed the deal. I already knew I wanted to be a Marine. Now I knew I wanted to fly. Uh, flying in the Marine Corps, loved it, was awesome, but I missed the engineering side of the house as well. So that led me to test pilot school and becoming a test pilot. And then naturally when NASA opened up the application process, you know, I, I looked at, at what I had done and realized, oh my goodness, I, I might have an actual shot at this just based on the experiences that I had. And unfortunately I was, uh, lucky enough to be selected in the class of 2013. So uh, I didn't have it really all figured out and planned out from day one, but I knew what I enjoyed in life and I just followed that dream. Chill. Well, I wanted to be an astronaut for as long as I can remember and what, what a privilege to, to have this opportunity. Um, I grew up in an Air Force family and, uh, and was really inspired by science fiction uh, movies and, and books. Um, but it was that first shuttle launch in 1981 when I was in second grade that really gave life to that dream. Uh, so I tried to figure out how do you become an astronaut. Um, I read a lot of uh, early biographies of our, of our uh, early astronauts and it looked like everybody, you know, you had to become a pilot and a test pilot. And growing up in an Air Force family, I had a desire to serve. I decided to, to go to the Air Force Academy. And it was at the Academy that I actually discovered a passion for biology and, uh, and for, um, for medicine. And so. I actually took a little bit of a turn. Um, I decided to go to medical school. I went to University of Colorado and trained in medicine. I went up to, to Minnesota to Hennepin County Medical Center to train in emergency medicine and that, and, and just had an absolute passion for that. Um, but I still had this desire to, to serve in human space flight. And so I came down, uh, I went down to Texas and I trained in aerospace medicine. I got a job as a flight surgeon at, at Johnson Space Center and then had the great fortune to get selected into the 2009 class. Um, and ultimately to get to fly to the International Space Station in 2015. Uh, it is such an amazing uh, privilege to be a part of this team. Cool. And Bob, Mr. Cabana? Oh man, Josh. So uh, when I was a little boy, 
I just wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to be a naval aviator and take off and land on aircraft carriers, and I never dreamed I could be an astronaut. I held those guys in such high esteem, watching them on black and white TV, and I just thought, man, wouldn't that be awesome? But I, I couldn't do that. And I was fortunate enough to get into the Naval Academy, and uh, my uh, senior year, the Physics Honor Society took a field trip down here to the Kennedy Space Center, and I remember seeing Apollo 13 launch. And Jim Lovell was a Naval Academy graduate, naval aviator, test pilot, and I thought, you know, maybe I could do that, but that was a long ways off. And so I worked hard, I got my wings. I, like Nicole, I chose a commission in the Marine Corps. Marine pilots are naval aviators. And uh, as soon as I got, uh, got to be a pilot and had a thousand hours, I said, I'd really like to be a test pilot and use all that math and engineering I had in school. And uh, I was able to get into test pilot school and I absolutely loved it. And while I was there, uh, as a test pilot, uh, John Young and Dan Brandenstein, a couple of astronauts, chief of the astronaut office, came up to PAX recruiting uh, NASA astronauts, and they wanted us to apply. And I said, well, dang, I, I actually qualify. And so I applied, and I didn't make it. And I was really disappointed. But I reapplied and was fortunate enough to uh, make it the next year. And, I, man, I, I just can't say, you know, how proud I am to be part of this team and how blessed I am to be able to have done the, the things I did. As far as getting to where I am, the last job I applied for was to be an astronaut. Ever since then, I, I've just done what I've been asked to do. I've never said no to an assignment, and I've always tried to do my very best at whatever I've been asked. And uh, one day I got asked if I'd be the director of the Kennedy Space Center, and I can't imagine not being, as hard as it was to leave all my friends in Houston, uh, I can't imagine uh, not having been part of this awesome team here at KSC going through this transition from shuttle to our future. Yeah. Can I just add, you know, I think uh, the common theme in, a, in, in the list of accomplishments and the journeys that, uh, that you've heard, hear, heard described here um, is, is team. And I think uh, for all of us, this is not an ind individual accomplishment, that along that journey that we are partnered with friends, family, teachers, coaches, mentors, that are all, you know, it's a group effort to, to get to be here today, and it's a group effort to to do something like we're gonna do here this weekend. Man, such a good word. Obviously, uh, be looking for your own support system and be a support system for others. I think that's, that's part of team is both ways. Um, Mr. Brinstein, uh, what important data did we get on Wednesday? Obviously, earlier today you mentioned this is the first wet dress rehearsal we had. Um, so what good data did we get that we can apply for future flights with Crew Dragon? I think the, the best data we got is that uh, everything seemed to work according to plan. Uh, we, we got the astronauts on board, we fueled the rocket, uh, we got the, the, uh, the launch abort system armed. All of these things are, are, are steps that we had not done yet with the astronauts on board, um, and everything worked, and we were go for launch. From a technical perspective, we were go for launch. Uh, we just got caught by the weather. So um, I think what we learned is that everything worked, <laughs> and, uh, and we're very happy about that. Now we're, we're, we're ready to take the next step and get these guys off the pad. Good. Love it. Um, uh, this is from a nine-year-old Abby um, asking our two flown astronauts here, what was the favorite thing you saw when you were in space? Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Boy, there, th that's, that's a hard question because there are so many amazing sights. For me personally, it was the very first time while I was still, we were still in the rocket, still climbing towards uh, low Earth orbit, that first view out of the window to see with your own eyes the, the gentle arc of Earth's horizon, um, highlighted by the sun, you know, you see so many pictures uh, of that. And to see that with your own eyes, uh, I mean, it gives me chills right now. And then on the space station, the opportunity to look back at the Earth and find uh, places where you grew up, places where you have friends, um, and, and to feel that connection uh, with, with your family, with your friends, and, uh, and with the Earth. Yeah, I, I got a second that. Um, you know, I would have loved to have had a long duration flight but I think what I remember most is just our Earth is a beautiful blue jewel of a planet. And you, you see the horizon about like that from 220 nautical. And there's this thin little hazy line over it. And that's our atmosphere. That's all that's protecting us from that harsh void of space with its extreme temperatures and ultraviolet radiation. And space is the darkest black you can possibly imagine. No black on Earth does it just as when you're on the sunlit side of the Earth. It's just the absence of anything. But I always told first time flyers when I was chief of the astronaut office, uh, while you're up there, you got to stick your nose up to a window and make a memory. And uh, time on orbit is very expensive. There's very little free time. 
but you, you don't take a picture. Make a memory because uh, pictures uh, fade and they don't do it justice. What you see with the eyes that God gave you is so much better. And my last flight, we were coming up over uh, Baja Peninsula across the United States, and there was a big high pressure system. It was night over the uh, United States, and we flew right over my hometown, Minneapolis, St. Paul. I could see where my grandparents' farm was. We went up into Canada, and I looked down, and I could see all the lights of the cities outlining the Great Lakes, like you were looking down on a map from, you know, west of Chicago to Long Island. And it's just memories like that I will cherish forever, and they are never going to fade. Cool. Nicole, I look forward to asking you the same question, hopefully here really, really soon. Absolutely. And Mr. Brenstein, last question for you today. I'm going to ask you to speak for the entire NASA family. And the question is just simple. What, what, is it, what does it feel like to be a part of history? I'll tell you, um, it's, it's, it's uh, the honor of a lifetime for this season in my life to be at the helm of this very storied agency. Um, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And um, we're not here because of me. <laughs> Uh, I just have the, the unique opportunity to be at this moment in time in this position. I want to give a lot of credit to Charlie Bolden, my predecessor as the NASA administrator. Um, and and the, the commercial crew program was started under his leadership. And back then, he wasn't getting the support that it needed. Um, and, and, you know, Congress wasn't funding it at the level that it needed to be funded, and yet he persevered. And because of his hard work, his determination, um, you know, make no mistake, uh, we now have great support. <laughs> uh, but we had to go through some tough times before we got to where we are right now, and the support we're getting now is overwhelming. So uh, my hat's off to Charlie Bolden, and, and he told me when I took this job, we sat down, had a long chat. He said, Jim, everything that happens under your watch, you take credit for. <laughs> and I said, sir, he's a general in the Marine Corps. He's also a NASA astronaut, um, Navy pilot by trade. Uh, naval aviator, I should say, not a Navy pilot, but a naval aviator as a Marine Corps pilot. Um, and he said, Jim, you take credit. And I said, sir, uh, this, is, this is a team effort. And, and um, what makes this available today is continuity of purpose over long periods of time. It's why we need sustainable programs. It's why we work every day on making sure that 30 years from now, the Artemis program, which Chell just talked about, the Artemis program is going to be here 30 years from now. We're going to have a sustainable presence on the surface of the moon, and in fact, we're going to be on Mars. Cool. Man, good words. I appreciate all that. Thank you all for being here today. I know we're all anxious to see this baby fly. Um, so that's going to do it for us here today. I want to remind everyone to tune in tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We will begin coverage leading up to a 3.22 p.m. Eastern time liftoff of the Crew Dragon. And I'll leave it by just saying, go Falcon, go Dragon. Let's launch America.